Hi everyone, I'm so glad you're here for my latest webinar on my five dog training principles that work. How to train your dog for just minutes a day and have the best dog on the block. Here's a little about me and why you should trust my advice. My name is Heather and I'm a certified professional dog trainer from Delaware. I got my certification through Animal Behavior College and has spent the last five years training dogs in many different capacities. A big part of my business is training with clients one-on-one -on -one in their homes with their dog. You might say that I train my clients to train their dogs. We have great fun. I love seeing the dog's personalities come out as he goes through training. So this webinar is about my five dog training principles that work and will help you train your dog in just minutes a day. Just so you know, you'll be watching recorded presentation, but I'm still here live like underneath all this answering your questions while you watch the presentation. I have a super hard time presenting while also trying to keep up with the questions and I want you to have all my attention. But before we start, I want to make sure that this presentation is right for you. If you believe in using force, fear, or pain when training a dog, then this presentation is not going to be your jam at all. If you want to learn positive training techniques, then this is for you. If you hang with me to the end of this webinar, you'll get access to a free guide that has been a wildly popular product and one I'd like to give to you for free for sticking around on this journey. But I'll definitely tell you more about that later. All right, so let's jump in and get started with my first principle of dog training. And that is to teach good behaviors instead of always just punishing the bad. I wanted to start with a quote from Vic Victoria Stilwell, who you might have heard of. She's a celebrity trainer who practices positive reinforcement training like me. Victoria says of harsh punishment, when dog trainers or pet owners resort to harming animals in an effort to train them, it weakens the relationship. Training should be fun and stimulating for both people and their pets. When training becomes painful or frightening, it will induce stress and anxiety in dogs, and that's not a desired outcome. Back in the 60s, dog training looked much, much different than it does today, thank goodness. Back then, you were expected to use punishment at every opportunity during training to make sure that your dog never became dominant. So painful leash corrections, alpha rolls, and hitting or yelling were techniques that a lot of trainers of the time taught their clients. Dog training looked more like torture than training. You were expected to break the dog of ever thinking that he was the head of the household, as if dogs sit around and try to plot ways to become the head of the household. Dogs were often deprived of socialization and never taught how to properly engage with humans and other dogs. I actually know some people today who do still do that. They deny their dogs any freedom to meet other people or play spontaneously like dogs often do. Their dogs are well trained, but fun, goofy, playful, not one bit. 60 years later, we know that dogs never seek dominance and don't have the capacity of that level of abstract thinking. You see, studies done on wolves back in the 70s showed that they live in packs with a dominant male. This led very well-meaning very well -meaning but ill-informed scientists to assume that dogs did the same. So if you tried to put a dog into a human family, he would fight for dominance as, his, as he would view the family as a pack that he had to dominate. Today, scientists believe that dogs really aren't even pack animals. Free-range dogs in India, which has the largest population of free-range dogs, only form very loose-fitting pack, packs when a food resource is found. Then they return back to their own solitary lives. Dogs don't hunt together, they don't stay within their family unit or live together like wolves. So the need to ever break your dog of his attempt at dominance is considered absolutely absurd today. As a side note, sadly, there are still some trainers, not many, 
and dog owners who still insist on using pain and fear to train. We live in such a punitive society that some cannot get past the notion of having to use strict punishment to train their dogs. One thing that I was taught early on in my training career was that the average dog is about as smart as the average human toddler. If that's true, would you choke your toddler on a chain if he messed up his ABCs? Would you punish him for getting the wrong answer in school? Well, of course, there are those parents who do just that, but it's abusive and completely unnecessary to teaching. I use positive reinforcement to train dogs. That means that when training a dog a certain behavior, such as a down or a sit, if he doesn't do it right instead of punishing, I give him another chance and praise and reward when he does get it right. It's called setting the dog up for success. It's no different than asking a child a math question, let's say. He gets it wrong, so instead of punishing him in front of the class, you give him another chance to earn his gold star. Behavior that is rewarded is likely to be repeated. Training would be miserable to me, my clients, and the dog if it was all based on punishment. We know now that it's unnecessary to have anything but some good fun while training. I'm not saying that you won't meet your fair share of challenges, but using praise and a more positive approach is the best way to train. I think it's important that we discuss what to do when your dog is doing something that you don't want him to do. Let's say your dog jumps up on you and everyone that comes into the house. This is an extremely frustrating behavior and one that can take some time to break as it's totally natural for dogs to jump. A lot of my clients come to me with that challenge and tell me that they've been kneeing their dog in the chest when he jumps up. The problem is that doesn't work but they keep on doing it for weeks or months on end. But should the dog then just be allowed to continue jumping all over everyone? Absolutely not. And at this point, you choose your punishment. The type I would recommend and the only type that I really use in this situation and what most positive trainers would suggest is to ignore the jumping and deprive the dog of any of your attention until he stops jumping. So the punishment is the withdrawal of your attention and affection. When he decides to stop jumping, he gets your attention back with a nice treat to indicate that he did the right thing. But if we stop here, we've only solved half the problem. That's what this whole section is about. And that's where most people stop. What you need to do is teach the dog what you want him to do when you come home or guests come over. It's one thing to teach him he gets ignored when jumping. It's another thing to go the extra but extremely necessary step of teaching the behavior you do want. If you'd like your dog to sit when you come home or when guests come over, then teach him that. And then you've completed the training equation. You're not just punishing for the jumping, you're teaching what you want him to do. So many people forget this part of training and it's really essential. Let's look at another example. Let's say your dog begs when you're sitting at your table for a meal. Maybe he puts his head on your knee or sits under your chair and whines. You can ignore him and deprive him of your attention, which is half the equation. But then you need to come up with something that you want your dog to do during your meal times. So let's say you decide that you want him to go to his bed while you eat. Perfect. That is not such a tough thing to train. I would start with teaching him to go to his bed, then I would add a stay command and build up some duration to his stay. Then I would add back in your meal while he's in the bed giving a stay. This may take days or weeks for your dog to learn, be prepared that for the first few meals, the dog will likely break the stay and come to the table. Just reset him and after time, he'll be fine in his bed while you eat. But just stick with it and lead him right back to his bed. It's going to take some repeti repetitions, but you will eventually have a dog that goes to his bed during your meal time. Why? 
because you took the time to teach the desired behavior instead of only punishing the bad behavior. If there's ever a behavior that you want to cease, you need to teach a replacement behavior so your dog knows what to do instead. Decades ago, when trainers only used punitive techniques and aversives in training, dogs did get trained. After all, a behavior that is punished is likely to stop. But the methods and the level of pain and fear inflicted were completely unnecessary. Like I mentioned before, our dogs don't sit around trying to come up with ways where they can be dominant over us. It isn't within their DNA to do that. Humans are the ones that do that. Okay, guys, I'm getting some great questions at this point. Keep them coming. I'm trying to keep up with them as quickly as I can. This is some really awesome responses that I'm getting from you. Let's move on to my second principle of dog training, which is to never push a dog to failure when training. My motto when it comes to dog training is that training should be fun. You and your dog should be engaged and want to participate in the training session. If either one of you isn't feeling it, then come back to it later. Long ago, when trainers were taught to use force, pain, and fear to train, they routine, routinely had their clients push their dogs to failure. What do I mean by that? They would force the dog to keep training well past a reasonable amount of time and repetitions. And then when the dog failed, the clients were told to punish the dog. One of my key foundations of training is to never push your dog to failure. If you ask for repetitions of the down command and your dog bangs out five perfect downs, but then messes up on number six and number seven, then just stop the training session. Or better yet, end it on a positive note and ask your dog for something easier that he readily can do than praise and reward. As humans, it's so much within our nature to push and push. If you've ever had a personal trainer to help you get in shape, you know what it's like to have someone in your face yelling that you have to keep doing more even when you know you've reached your breaking point. And I get it. I know that screaming in your face is supposed to be some sort of motivation for people. That's not how it works for me. We have the ability to tell our trainers that we can't do another repetition, but dogs don't, at least not verbally. But when they start to give the wrong behavior or just check out of the training session altogether, they are trying to tell you that they have reached their breaking point. Sadly, dog parents don't always heed that communication and continue to expect what they consider 100% participation in the training session. If dogs could talk, they'd tell us that there are days when they don't want to train or maybe they only want to train for a few minutes that day. Dogs may tell us that they find something a little more difficult and will need extra time practicing it before you throw in the towel and assume your dog is the one who can't hold a stay. The whole idea of failure in dog training comes from us humans, not the dogs. The expectations I see some of my clients putting on their dogs can be astronomical and quite sad. I've had many conversations where I explain to clients that learning basic obedience is not an emergency and will take how long it's going to take. Certain breeds tend to train faster, but that isn't carved in stone. However, consistently working on training will produce results. For positive trainers like myself who use positive reinforcement to train dogs, the whole idea is to set your dog up for success. And you're going to hear that theme more and more through this presentation. When you ask for those five downs, you want to do everything in your power to make sure that your dog has the right tools to land those five downs. You want to make sure that when you trained him to give a down, you positively reinforced him with a treat or praise so that he knew when he was getting it right. Pushing a dog to failure means that when he gets it wrong, you punish, even if he got five right. I've written this before, 
and I'm sure that I'll repeat it again, behaviors that are rewarded are likely to be repeated. Another aspect of pushing a dog to failure is when we don't consistently put in the time or energy to train and get disappointed when the dog fails at giving the behaviors we're asking for. Training will not happen overnight, but you must work on it on a regular basis. And you must build up your dog's ability to give you certain behaviors instead of assuming right out of the gate that they will know what you mean when you ask for something, even though you haven't worked on it for two weeks. Let me give you a human example of what it looks like when teaching with, excuse me, let me give you a human example of what it looks like when you teach and push to failure. When we teach a child the ABCs, we begin at the lowest possible level with one or two letters and gradually increase the difficulty when we feel the child can handle the additional information. It makes perfect sense. We also continuously reinforce the new learning with high praise, stickers, and the occasional treat. This encourages the child to continue to learn and to do so with a positive attitude. This is the way that you avoid pushing the failure. As the child develops in maturity and as their learning capability expands and strengthens, we practice with the new information until it becomes second nature. In the example of the ABCs, we sing songs, provide them with coloring books, and encourage them to write the letters out in fun and engaging manner. But all of this takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. We understand that the process of learning the alphabet can be a long one and that through the process, the learning can never stop, but that it rather evolves through stages. We understand that stopping can set us back. So it becomes a matter of countless repetitions. Unlike a human child, we don't view a dog's learning or education as something requiring a long-term effort. We essentially see learning as a short-term effort that the dog should pick up on relatively quickly. You need to put in the time and effort with some degree of regularity. That means consistency, not just sometimes, not just when you feel like it, but all the time. The skills that you're hoping to teach must become a lifestyle for yourself and the dog. And through all of this effort, you'll need to reward the progress because results aren't going to come overnight. Results worth having can take a while before they're seen or even recognized. But rest assured, I promise you, if you put in the work and demonstrate patience, you will see results with your dogs. If you do nothing and expect that your dog should be able to do something you've barely taught them, you're pushing your dog to failure. You're taking away any opportunity for praise or reward and replacing that with punishment. If the child learning his ABCs was asked to recite the alphabet after only having been taught it once, he would fail and would most likely not be very motivated to continue learning. Dogs can do the same thing. If you push them into a miserable training experience that only ends in failure, you will have trouble finding a willing participant. So turn that strategy 180 degrees around and set your dog up for success. Okay, so now we're moving on to my next principle of dog training, and please keep those questions coming. These are great. How to spend just minutes a day training your dog with success. One of the first questions any trainer hears from a new client is about how long they have to train with their dog each day. Of course, the ultimate decider is the dog. If you have a puppy, keep training short and sweet but an older, highly motivated dog may give you a good 45 minutes straight of attention. But that doesn't mean you have to train for that long. Clients often worry that they won't be able to give enough time to training, and some will admit that they just don't want to train that much. I get it. Sometimes the idea of a training session is just too much, but it doesn't have to be. Yes, you have to work with your dog consistently to see progress, but your normal day has tons of built-in opportunities for you to train. It doesn't always have to be a formal training session. Success is going to come if you're consistent. You reward the good behaviors and you honor your dog's willingness to train at any given moment. You can achieve 
all that in 20 seconds of training or 20 minutes of training. You just have to find the opportunities. Let me just add right here. If you're not willing to put in the minimum, cats make really great pets. <laughs> so let's go over some events during your day that can be turned into training opportunities. Before you put your dog's food bowl down, ask for a sit. It's very simple. If he starts to break the sit before the bowl is on the floor, raise the bowl back up until he remains seated and put the bowl back on the floor again. Before you let him out of his crate, ask for a sit. Same idea as the bowl on the floor. Don't open the crate door all the way until he's calm and sitting. Another example. Start a game of tug with him, but every once in a while, make him drop the toy. Then ask for a sit before you start the game again. Before you give him a nice bone, ask for a down before putting the bone down between his front paws. He must stay in the down position while you're lowering the bone. Another example. Before you walk out the door for a walk, have your dog sit while you leash him. If he jumps or won't start moving, wait until he sits still. It may take a few minutes and may feel like a battle of wills, but reinforcing the sit and teaching your dog impulse control is invaluable. Once he can sit to be leashed, make him sit while you open the door. If he tries to dash out, close the door and start over. Now notice something. In any of these examples, depending on what you've taught your dog, you can ask for a touch, a high five, a sit, a down. Just pick any good behavior you've taught them. When you're out for a walk, ask for a sit or down or touch at every corner. Remember that no matter how good he is at these behaviors, you still want to praise, praise, praise. As you can see, you're reinforcing these good behaviors in very simple ways that demand very little time, but it still counts toward training. I do still recommend that you have mini training sessions where you just work on one new behavior for maybe 10 repetitions, but let your daily routine include training op opportunities all day long. The idea that basic obedience training should require hours of homework is a relic from the past. It is a total myth that a family dog would need that level of homework to learn very basic skills. But I have worked with trainers that require an hour or more of homework each day. Sadly, their clients don't always stick around and their dog never gets trained. I make a point of learning my client's schedule so I can recommend little bits of time when training will fit in. If you're watching Netflix snuggled on the couch, Ask your dog for 10 downs. Drinking your coffee with the morning paper, ask for 10 touches. Sitting outside on a beautiful day, ask for any command that your dog hasn't learned yet outside. Just for 60 seconds, boom, there's a training session. I'll close by saying if you're involved with sporting or competition with your dog where he needs to learn more complicated behaviors, Longer training sessions will absolutely be needed. But for a family dog with kick-ass manners, a small commitment in time and consistency will go a long way. All right, guys. My next principle of dog training is to train the dog you have. This is an all-too-frequent conversation that I have with some of my training clients who have recently gotten a new puppy or dog. They may say, oh, my last golden retriever never acted like this. She only took a few days to train, but Fido is taking forever to train. I can't handle it. Or I've had dogs all my life and none of them have ever been this hyper or destructive. She's just a bad dog. These are just a few examples of what it's like to work with a client who has either gotten the wrong dog for their lifestyle or who doesn't want to consistently train because none of their past dogs required that much work. What do I say to this? You have to train the dog you have. It's as simple as that and it is key to getting your dog in the most successful position he can be within the family. I've had clients rehome dogs 
simply because they realized that they were going to need to work harder at training the new dog. They assumed all poodles were exactly the same or all Labradors were the same. So when they started training the new dog, only to realize that he may be more challenging to train, they gave up no matter what I've said. I've seen the same thing happen when clients have gotten puppies or dogs that require huge amounts of exercise. To be blunt, these dogs are wrong for someone who is used to calmer and lazier dogs. And no matter how much experience you have with slower paced dogs, nothing will prepare you for the needs of a high energy dog. <clears throat> Excuse me. But that is not the dog's fault. He's not a bad dog for needing to run but he needs to be exercised and trained in a way that works for him. To be honest, I really blame breeders and shelters for not fully preparing their clients for the needs their new dog will have. Putting your own expectations on a new dog based on a past experience gets you nowhere when you go to train your new dog. Just like a human newborn, you need to let your dog's personality and temperament develop without being disappointed that he isn't a carbon copy of your last dog. You need to be willing to work with a trainer that has many different training tools in their kit. What worked with your last dog may not be the best approach with your new dog. By not opening yourself up to trying different training tactics, you're depriving your new dog of the benefits of being trained. In order to successfully train the dog you have, you need to embrace the dog you have. I have a client right now who has a ton of experience with golden retrievers. She and her husband are older and decided that instead of getting another golden, they get an Australian Shepherd. Well, if you know anything about Aussies, they need to work and run a lot. They need mental stimulation and are typically very easy to train. But you cannot train a dog that hasn't gotten enough exercise for days on end. Every time I go over there to train, I'm greeted by the same thing. A dog using the house as an obstacle course and an owner trying to figure out why her Aussie isn't more like her Goldens. What tends to happen when people don't train the dog they have is that they lose interest in training altogether instead of taking on the challenge. Dogs will often end up with incomplete training or an owner that is sloppy with training and sending mixed messages. Then the dog gets in trouble for not being well trained. So before you make a decision to bring a new dog into your home, know that you aren't getting your old dog back. You have to commit to your new dog and embrace him. Ask tons of questions from the breeder or shelter and make sure you're taking on only what you can manage and have fun training, training the dog you have. So we're coming to the close. My last principle of dog training is to make sure that your dog is trained in all environments and isn't a product of incomplete training. One thing that most people don't know when they go about training their dog is that dogs don't generalize very well. Meaning, if you teach your dog to sit in the kitchen and each time you ask her to sit, you're in the kitchen, will she know how to sit on the back deck? Probably not at first. Sitting in the kitchen is different than on the back deck, so you may need to start at the beginning again. Typically, however, progress will be faster. Sometimes just moving from the kitchen into an adjoining room can throw off a dog being asked for a sit. So what happens when your dog is doing a great sit inside and on the back deck? Does he now know the behavior rock solid? Not quite yet. You see you start training in the least distracting environment, which is typically inside the home. Then you move to a backyard, which is a little bit more distracting then you take it on the road, as I say. The dog that nails his sits in the home and backyard needs to be in an even more distracting environment, such as a park. Now, remember, if the park is full of people and dogs, you're going to need treats to keep your dog's attention on you. Be very distracted, 
and may need several opportunities to give the sit behavior. But when he finally nails it and then can do it without a treat, we in the dog training world call that behavior proofed. With my private clients, I make sure that everything the dog has learned inside, he can do outside as well. Without taking those final steps, training is incomplete. To graduate from my training programs, the dog should be able to focus, sit, lay down, touch, stay, go to place, heal, and come when called in a park setting or Home Depot or a pet store that is highly distracting. Incomplete training can be very problematic if you assume that if your dog knows how to come when called in the house, that he can also do it outside. If he's never been taught the behavior outside, he doesn't know it outside. Now you have a dog on the loose without a reliable means of calling him back. As the dog's parent, you need to make sure that all new behaviors are proofed before you start ever thinking of punishing the dog for not giving the behavior you asked for in a totally new environment. I've had clients tell me that their dog won't lay down outside out of spite. They say they know how to do it, but just won't do it to be spiteful. Guys, let me be totally honest here. Dogs aren't smart enough to sit around and be spiteful or passive aggressive. They don't try and think of ways to piss you off. They just don't know how to give the behavior when there's new distractions around. So take the five or 10 minutes and remind him what sit looks like. Bring the best treats like chicken or cheese and get his attention on training and off the other dogs. Complete training is such a foundational pillar of all training and something that I really try and get my students to strive for. If you live in an area with lots of dogs, it's unacceptable if yours is the one misbehaving outside all the time. Trust me, there are plenty of non-dog people out there who would be extremely unnerved if your dog jumped up on them. You need to do your due diligence and make sure that no matter where your dog is and who he's around, he can give you the behavior you ask for. In my experience, and here's just a little training nugget, it all starts with teaching the focus cue. There's a process of teaching your dog his name so that no matter where you are, when you say his name, he stops what he's doing and he looks to you. Once you have a dog that will stop engaging in whatever he's doing to look to you when you say his name, you have a dog that is totally primed for obedience training. Everything that comes after that is going to be so much easier if he knows his name rock solid in every environment. So whatever stage of training you may be in, commit to following through until your dog knows his behaviors everywhere, no matter who or what may be a distraction. Let him be the rock star he was destined to be. Okay, guys, so everything that you've learned here today will help you set your dog up for success. These are the foundation methods that must be a part of your training. Everything is built on these principles. For all of you here now, thank you so much for making it through my webinar. I'm hoping desperately that you got some good information out of this. It really is the foundation information you need to train your dog. And for you guys, you'll be getting an email bonus guide on how to start out right with your dog. It's an 11 page guide that my private clients get before each training program starts. It gives you an awesome overview of dog ownership and what you need to do to get going with your dog. So like I did in the beginning, I promise you'd get something, some swag from me. Well, there you have it. But I wanna do you one better. For making it through the webinar, I'd like to make you an offer you can't refuse. Since most, if not all of you, aren't able to hire me to do private training in your home, I've come up with a comprehensive online training program that I know you will love. You can train your dog in your pajamas, in your home, on your own schedule.
my complete canine training course is based on what you've learned today and features detailed training videos often made right from private training sessions and handouts on everything from basic training commands to behavior modification to stopping unwanted naughty habits your dog may have. And if you buy this program today, you get a free coaching call with me scheduled at your convenience. We can troubleshoot anything you need, may need help with one-on-one -on -one so we can perfect the dog's training. And most importantly, you get me. If you buy this program, you get me. That's right. For the life of your dog, I will always be around to help you troubleshoot anything as personal students of mine. I will never leave you stranded not knowing how to properly train your dog. I think this sounds like a pretty good deal, right? Are you ready to jump in and make the commitment to train your dog completely once and for all? My program includes such topics as how to potty train and crate train your dog, how to teach him to stop jumping up or incessantly barking, how to stop begging or counter surfing. You'll also have videos and handouts galore on how to train your dog the basic commands such as sit, down, leave it, and the other basic commands. And no, these videos were not created in some fancy training facility. In fact, most were made during live training sessions with my clients and their dogs. This gives you an opportunity to see a real dog who doesn't know the skill learning the behavior in real time. I do include sessions with my own dog who knows the behaviors to give you a benchmark of what the finished product should look like, but you have tons of opportunities to see my actual clients in training action. Now, I could charge some big bucks for this online, online course as it is that comprehensive and that successful. But for you, I'm only charging $297 for the entire course. A payment plan is also available to make it easier for purchase. You get modules that cover learning theory. Then we move into working on behavior management, like how to get your dog to stop jumping, begging, or barking. And then we head into the training section where I use videos of both my dogs and actual clients' dogs to train the major behaviors. You get real life training videos so you can learn how to troubleshoot the way I do with my own clients. Plus, let's not forget the bonus coaching call you get with me as my special thank you for trusting in my course. All right, guys, so let's start taking some more questions. This has been so much fun fire away and I will answer as many as I can. Thanks guys.